Internet Informed, Guidance for the Dedicated Searcher, as read by the author, David Novak. This book is an element of The Spire Project. Chapter 1, Precision. If a search is war, then the global search engine is our sword. Grab this favorite weapon of ours, march into battle, and swing. Many a battle can be fought and won with this sword, especially if the enemy is a peasant, a simpleton. Occasionally we need finesse. Sometimes we need much, much more. Let us hold this sword of ours correctly. Let us address the punctuation accepted by the vast global search engines. Search engine punctuation consists of a set of tactics that allow us to insist search engines provide us with specific information. We will describe what specific means later in the chapter, but these tactics are widely used in library circles since they form a foundation for searching all computerized databases. From library book catalogs to the most expensive of patent databases, we use tactics with names like proximity indicators, Boolean operators, and field search terms. It's all very complex. On the Internet, however, these tactics often behave differently than library science would suggest. Many tactics are abridged and severely limited. We will look closely at quotes, the plus-minus symbol, the use of OR, and three field searches, title, URL, and link. There are further tactics. You may know some of them already. We will focus just on these since they provide almost all the tactical advantages we will need and since these tactics apply almost uniformly across the many search engines. Toss a few words at a search engine. Type something and receive a list of 100,000 matching results. More accurately, we receive the first 20 search results from a list 100,000 long. We do not get 100,000 results. We cannot get 100,000 results. We get only the top of this list. For many reasons we will address in Chapter 2 and 3, this may not be the start of a good search. We search in a more specific manner by adding punctuation. We can, for instance, insist two words appear next to each other on a web page. Insist a word appears in the title of a web page. Insist results have some element in the address of a web page and remove from our attention anything with a particular word, title, or element in its web address. Punctuation allows us to be specific with our attention. Yes, search engines practice a kind of relevancy ranking. They invite us to let them select which information we should browse. This ranking becomes more sophisticated every year. Ranking already duplicates some of the tactics I'm about to introduce. However, like the purist who believes everyone should learn to cook an egg, I believe we should all learn to punctuate our searches. Only then will we have the option to reject this ranking assistance. On certain occasions, throwing a few keywords at a search engine works very much to our advantage. Many occasions, if we seek general overviews or if we phrase our questions well. Yet if we ask a challenging, specific, or comprehensive question, throwing keywords fares rather badly indeed. Let us consider each tactic, each punctuation mark, in turn. Quotes. A search for Internet Service Provider reveals web pages with these three words. A search for, quote, Internet Service Provider, close quote, reveals web pages with this phrase. With quotes, we insist words appear together. In library speak, this is called basic proximity. When we place quotes around two or more words in our search query, we insist the results include these words together in order. A search for, quote, Internet Service Provider, close quote, will match only web pages with this phrase. As a search, this is enormously more specific than a search for Internet Service Provider, without quotes. A search that only asks that these three words appear somewhere on the page, in any order, together or apart. Thanks to ranking technology, the major search engines appear to render this tactic unnecessary. Search for a couple of words, perhaps someone's name, and web pages where our words appear beside each other are preferentially lifted to the top of the list. Adding quotes to a search may not change anything on the first page of results. Simple searches, however, lack a specific nature. When we are not specific, the number of matches means little. We will come to value this number soon. Including quotes in our search is the single simplest way to search more effectively. The use of quotes is a tactic that works on almost every search engine and most every search tool we will ever meet. Though some search tools may require we select as a phrase from a selection box instead. Occasionally, when we use quotes, we will retrieve results with our words separated by a comma, a period, or perhaps a stop word. Stop words are simply words search engines usually ignore. Words like a, the, and. 
irrespective, using quotes will always generate a far smaller and far more focused list of results. Search for a book title, a person's name, a phone number. Especially search for a concept like underground irrigation or unconditional love, and we should use quotes. I use quotes in at least half of all my searches. Suppose we seek information about an author, about me. A search for, quote, David Novak, close quote, research, will return a list of web pages about myself and, as it happens, another David Novak active in Jewish historical research. Such a search is specific. Search without quotes, search for David Novak research, and we generate a much longer list, 50 times longer, listing all web pages with these three words, David and Novak and research. Such a list is messy and unfocused, muddy. 49 and 50 of these references point to web pages by someone other than David Novak, perhaps by David Brown and James Novak, since all we ask is that our three keywords appear on a page. Use quotes for a more specific search. Remember this, and we need never ask a friend for the address to their website. Just ask how to spell their name. With a name in quotes and a single word describing one of their most obvious interests, we should have little difficulty in finding their website unless the person is almost unknown to the Internet. Incidentally, we can also use quotes with all library catalogs and all commercial quality databases. It works the same way. Secondly, we may not need to type the closing quotes, since search engines will often close quotes for us. A search for, quote, underground irrigation, lacking the closing quote marks, gives the same results as, quote, underground irrigation, close quotes. The plus minus symbol. A search for plus love reveals only those web pages with the word love. A search for minus love reveals only those web pages without the word love. A second tactic is to insist words appear or do not appear in the results. In library speak, this is called Boolean searching after mathematician George Boole, 1815 to 1864, who wrote a paper on the mathematics of logic. He described the mathematical use of the words and, or, and not and their role in set theory. You may remember studying this topic in high school along with Venn diagrams. This Boolean was once known as the insurmountable molehill, since older library studies showed the use of Boolean dumbfounded the lay public. On the internet, Boolean is worse. Without standards, with several search engines only recently accepting the use of brackets, and without knowing in advance how Boolean is applied on a particular search tool, Boolean falls apart at its seams. It becomes three different tactics, and, or, not. Our first step is to replace and with the plus symbol, and not with the minus symbol. Using the plus minus symbol avoids some confusing results on certain search tools. While most search tools interpret and and not correctly, I have yet to encounter a search tool that misinterprets the plus minus symbol. The plus minus is simple. Place the plus symbol immediately before a word to insist the word be present in every matching result. Place the minus symbol immediately before a word to insist the word must not appear in the reference document. Plus unconditional, plus love, minus medicine. Send this query to a search engine and we generate a list of web pages or web documents that include the words unconditional and love, but does not include the word medicine. It seems simple and it is. Furthermore, we can place the plus minus before quotes and in front of title tag and other tags we will introduce in a moment. So, plus, quote, David Novak, close quote, minus, title, colon, spire. Notice that plus comes before each and every word or word group. Miss the leading plus before David, and we will occasionally encounter search tools that will treat our first word as optional. We must address two simple changes to this picture at this time. The first requires a little history lesson. About six years ago, the popular press hammered the large global search engines mercilessly for returning millions of pages any time anyone typed a few words. At the time, a search for three blind mice would retrieve a list of tens of millions of matches simply because search engines considered pages with any of our words, even just one, as a match. The popular press had a field day with this confusion, making it the catchphrase for the chaos of the Internet. Then, almost overnight, all the primary global search engines change so as to presume that when we type several words, we want all these words. Today, global search engines assume a plus symbol precedes each word. We rarely need to use the plus symbol now. Plus is assumed. But beware. 
every so often I encounter some search tool that still defaults to any word. There is also something called a fuzzy and. A search for three words that return no matches triggers a search for pages with two of the three words we seek. That is, a fuzzy search gives the best answer it can, always offering some suggestion, even when nothing contains all the words we seek. AltaVista implemented fuzzy and for a time in 2002. In early 2006, I saw it again in Yahoo's video search. While rare, fuzzy and is fairly typical of the subtle oddities we encounter time and time again among the many Internet search tools. Historically, the use of plus was tremendously helpful back when it was not assumed. Today, we leave it off and just assume our search tools understand we want all our words. However, should ever we receive a confusing response from a search tool, and more on what constitutes a confusing response shortly, then one possibility is we have stumbled upon a search tool that does not assume the plus symbol. Now that we know how to use the plus symbol, set it aside. The second change to this picture we have just painted involves the use of the minus symbol, the not function, that changes the basic tenet of library science. When searching a commercial database, researchers are strongly advised against using the Boolean not, since the researcher is far too likely to remove items of interest. This is good advice. Consider a search for heartache, not love, on a medical article database. The use of not love will remove that perfect article that just happens to read, many doctors love to treat heartache with aspirin. The word love is present, so the reference is discarded. Yet this referenced article may be the only article in the database that connects aspirin with heartache. Commercial databases are best searched in a very specific manner with very limited, cautious use of not. Many of the search features of commercial quality databases, like a heavy use of descriptors and refined use of fields, assists us to craft very specific searches. The Internet, however, is a different beast to the commercial database. Google, by which I mean Google search, but henceforth I'll just refer to as Google, indexed over 8 billion records as of late 2005 and suggested greater than 20 billion as of late 2006, far more than any commercial database. Despite this, we miss great quantities of information when we reach for a global search engine. Unlike a commercial or library database, the global search engine delivers incomplete coverage. We search a fraction of the Internet. It's hard to say with certainty, hard even to guess, but I expect Google's index covers just 10% to 20% of the Internet directly. Any search misses much more than it searches. We will look more closely at coverage in time, but our struggle is not to sift carefully through a small quantity of articles from a carefully indexed, complete collection of literature. We shift rubble. If it's not love, get rid of it. Use the minus symbol frequently and with little regard for what is removed. There is far too much information out there for us to be concerned about a few references we mistakenly discard along the way. On to or. A search for search or research reveals web pages with either word. On to the next tactic. As of 2003, the top global search engines finally standardized their use of OR. As of 2006, the top three global search engines marry OR with brackets, in a way standard among commercial databases for decades. I want bracket pizza, quote, home delivery, close, quote, close bracket, OR bracket, Chinese, quote, takeaway, close, quote, close bracket. AltaVista started this trend, but now Yahoo, Google, and Microsoft Live Search accept OR and brackets. Other search tools accept OR, but not brackets. This word, OR, that word. Being precise here, OR means either, OR, or both. Just one word is required. If both appear, that's fine, too. We use OR on the Internet primarily to broaden the search by including synonyms and alternative spellings for our search words. We also use OR to allow for plurals. Hello or hi, reporter or journalist, color or color, heartache or heart ache, dog or dogs. This last example is surprisingly important since, as I write, global search engines consider dog and dogs as different words. We rarely care and usually mean dog or dogs, but we must convey this to the search engine each time by using OR, always in capital letters. OR works for phrases and quotes, so, quote, Hello Kitty, close quote, or, quote, Kero Keropi, close quote, and also for fields. In title, colon, quote, Hello Kitty, close quote, or in URL, colon, Hello Kitty. The first search 
returns pages with either the phrase Hello Kitty or Kiddo Kiddopi, or both. The second search returns pages with Hello Kitty either in the title or in the URL, or both. Allowing for alternative spellings, for synonyms, and for plurals in this way is good searching. It is professional. This tactic may reveal relevant information that would otherwise lay hidden. Personally, I don't often take the time to write properly inclusive searches rich in the use of OR. When a search of mine returns insufficient matches, I certainly reach for OR then. When an obvious synonym or comparable term arises, I certainly reach for OR. However, for simple searches I don't envision as difficult, I don't bother. I use OR in perhaps 10% of my searches. On to field searches. Finally, we reach field searching. In many ways, the pinnacle of Internet searching. Indeed, all good searching. Walk into a library, approach a computer, and seek a book by name. We are about to undertake a field search. The computer will search just the titles and authors of all the books within the library database. It searches the author title field. Alternatively, we could seek a book by looking first for a suitable subject. This is a different field. The field this time is a record of all subject headings. Dewey Decimal Number, yet another field. Title Author, Subject, and Dewey Decimal Number are each distinct fields. Each search is a field search. This is not a puzzling concept. It's just that field searches differ greatly from the generic search everything kind of search, a search often called a keyword search. My State Library online catalog allows searches by author, title, call number, so Dewey Decimal Number, and subject. Further fields include the year of publication, material type, serial type, language, publisher, and physical location. ERIC, the Educational Resource Information Center at eric.ed.gov, is a prominent free commercial quality database of education-related literature. It has more fields, author, title, ERIC number, journal citation, major descriptors, all descriptors, identifiers, abstract, geographic source, institution name, publication type, publication date, ISBN, ISSN, clearinghouse number, government availability, note and language. We can search for something in any of these categories, in any of these fields. The U.S. Library of Congress online catalog, or LOCOC, at catalog.loc.gov contains records to over 29 million books and millions more manuscripts. It has many more fields. In addition to author, subject, title, corporate author, publication date, and publisher, a further 30 fields exist. As you may suspect, field searching is very significant to library and commercial research. A field has a strict meaning in computer science as an area of a database record into which a particular item of data is entered. The library science definition is more suited to searching since it insists on a logical category of bibliographic description. That is, fields concern a fact about the information. For some commercial databases, a tremendous amount of work infuses the accurate development of fields, such as abstracts and descriptors. A definitive list of descriptors, called a thesaurus, may be created to standardize classification and assist searching. To categorize inventions, the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, created the International Patent Classification, IPC, a complex system of patent classification that is updated and improves every three years. The IPC, now on version 8, is pivotal to searching patents. Field searching is a vital step in the effective use of any of commercial quality information database. However, the Internet is most certainly not commercial quality, nor professionally organized. We have only three fields available of note, title, URL, and link. Yet searching these three fields is pivotal to using the Internet effectively. Much of this book will tease out implications that arise directly or indirectly from two of these three fields. Brilliant searching starts here. On to the title search. A search for in title colon Jupiter reveals web pages with Jupiter in the title. On the Internet, the title is the first few words that appear at the very top left bar of our web browser. For readers who understand hypertext markup language, HTML, the title corresponds to the words found between the two title tags, title and slash title, positioned near the start of all web pages. The title usually describes the content of the web page in just a few words. Most titles are just two to six words in length, and many are completely unrelated to the topic of the web page. Consequently, title searches are rather clumsy. Few web pages about Afghanistan will include Afghanistan in their title. Yes, web pages with Afghanistan in the title most certainly discuss Afghanistan in some manner, and this may sound promising. 
However, searching well involves being a little more specific than this. Even if we seek something general, it is better to undertake a search for prominence, the topic of Chapter 2, than a crude, brutish search by title. If we have a reason to expect a word belongs in the title, then proceed. Otherwise, this very hit-and-miss approach will reveal perhaps only 5% of the relevant documents. Yes, a crude tactic indeed. To request the title search, simply proceed the search word or words with the term in title colon. Type this into the standard search box of a global search engine. So, in title colon spire. Right into the standard box. If you prefer Yahoo, by which I mean Yahoo search, use the little text box on yahoo.com, not their advanced search page. If you prefer Google, use this small search box on google.com, not their advanced search page located elsewhere. Type in title colon spire for web pages with spire in the title. Type in title colon quote spire project close quote retrieves web pages with the phrase spire project in the title. Be sure not to include a space between the in title colon and the word or phrase to follow. In title colon space spire is a request for two words, not one in the title. Also, keep in mind the field search terms like in title colon can change over time. Yahoo once used title colon, but now matches Google with in title. Microsoft's live search must have recently added in title colon as well. Other search tools may use the previous standard field search term of title colon. On to the URL search. A search for in URL colon Jupyter reveals web pages with Jupyter within the web address. URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. It's the specific location on the Internet for an item of information. Now that most everything is migrated to the web, URL roughly translates as web address, HTTP colon something or another. There is a subtle difference between the meaning of URL and web address, since URLs can point to destinations that are not strictly web pages, perhaps a news group, a telnet service, or an FTP archive. Differences like these were once very important to searching the Internet, but no longer. Information moves to, between tools too easily and too much is migrated to the web. Format is a more effective concept, a topic for Chapter 4. The web address is an elegant system to place each item of information at a unique location. With a URL search, we ask a search engine to reveal just the information that shares some element in its web address. There is a great deal of information to be found within an address, more than country code or type of organization, edu.gov.com. For instance, information within the same directory shares most of the same address. Thus, being able to search for a specific URL allows us to ask for a list of all the web pages a search engine has found within a particular directory. This is actually extremely empowering. We know of it as local context, and we'll speak of it further in Chapter 3. At this moment, however, let us just note that the URL field is a field. We can search much like the title field. We can insist on or exclude information that has something particular in its URL. To request a URL field search, simply proceed our URL segment with the term in in URL colon. Thus, in URL colon Wikipedia is a search for web pages with Wikipedia somewhere within the web address. Once again, search engines differ. The previous standard of URL colon has shifted now that Yahoo, but not all the web, uses in URL like Google. Microsoft Live Search, as of early 2006, uses neither, not as described here. During July 2006, between June and July 2003, and again even earlier, Google dropped the support of in-URL. All the web allows URL colon word, but not URL colon address. The list of complications goes on and on. Part of this difficulty rests with a very similar site field search, requested as site colon domain name. Site is not nearly as flexible as in-URL, so I rarely use site when in-URL is available. Site does allow us to ask for a list of web pages in a particular domain, so site colon bbc.co.uk will return a list of web pages from that website. However, site does not permit us to reach into a specific directory to find truly local information, except in some ways on Google, or to request specific word in a web address. Just as an aside, if you do use the site search, or the URL field search for that matter, see if you can drop the www, the host name that precedes most addresses, site colon bbc.co.uk and in url colon wikipedia.org will often lead to far more results than the similar search of site colon www.bbc.co.uk and in url colon www.wikipedia.org.
Much of the English material on the Wikipedia, for instance, resides at en.wikipedia.org. A search for in URL www.wikipedia.org would miss it. I really like how Google handles their URL field search. For many years, their in URL field search term was not widely known. Their advanced search page used a clumsy all in URL, which we can ignore, and now a site search. Their help page only recently began to mention in URL at all. With the past standard as URL colon, which Google never supported, few people ever knew Google permitted in URL. It is Google's hidden field search. I had a role in revealing in URL in the late 1990s, I will tell you about later. Just keep in mind, this field rocks. I use the URL field very frequently, perhaps 20% of the time. You must learn how to do a URL field search on your favorite search engine, or adopt a search engine with a flexible URL field search. On to the link search. A search for link colon wikipedia.org reveals web pages linking to wikipedia.org. The link is a connection from one web page to another. Essentially, a link directs attention towards another page. Click a link and we move the focus of our web browser to the newly referenced page. Links appear as images or text. For readers who understand HTML, the link comes from a href equals quote web address, close quote, usually found as an a href slash a. The link field refers to only the inbound links, links originating on web pages elsewhere on the internet. Do not confuse this with a list of links on the page itself, links going elsewhere, links we shall call outbound links. The link field search enables us to ask a search engine to list links pointing at the web page we specify. We provide the web address and the search engine replies with web pages that link to that address. In a superficial way, the more inbound links a web page has, the more popular and more recognized the web page. This is why search engines use the number and presumed significance of inbound links in their ranking technologies. References that appear at the top of a search engine results page usually point to web pages with the most inbound links. We'll explore this further in Chapter 2. Once again, there is more to this link field. We can use the link field searches to discover further related resources. Simply work backwards, then forwards again to the link companions. We can use the link search in a quality assessment as one of several types of endorsements. We can even triangulate our way to information resources with link search. At this moment, just note the link field is a field. We can search just like the title and URL fields. To request the link search, simply type a web address and proceed it with the field search term of link colon. Do not include the HTTP colon slash slash since some search engines will not like it. Once again, no space between link colon and the address to follow. Thus, link colon wikipedia.org is a search for all web pages that link to wikipedia.org. Link colon has long been the standard search term for a link search. I can recall no search engines using another term. Google does not appear to show all the linking pages it knows about, perhaps only those with a decent page rank, a topic for Chapter 2. Yahoo Search has a specialized link domain colon field search term I occasionally find helpful. The link domain field uncovers links pointing to any page within a given domain. Lastly, as I write, Google and Yahoo both do not permit searches for multiple links, as in link colon google.com, link colon yahoo.com. For this kind of triangulation, I use all the web. On to further fields and complexity. That about completes how we ask for a title, URL, and link field search. Remember, this is just the internet version of the library's author title, subject, and Dewey Decimal number search. We will shortly see the URL and link field searches lead to some very sophisticated search techniques indeed. Global search engines offer a range of fields beyond these three, including perhaps language, file type, topic, anchor text, update date, and adult content. These are all valid search tactics and may be important for certain search occasions. I have heard from teachers who find it rewarding to search for PPT files uh, from Microsoft PowerPoint because such searches often provide a good overview to a topic. I have heard from lawyers who limit their search to PDF files, Adobe's portable document format, because PDF documents tend to be more authoritative. Topic searches like Google's U.S. government search, Yahoo's product search, and Technorati's blog search will come back to us in Chapter 6. Some of these searches we can avoid. Set aside file type, because we will learn in Chapter 4 that format is a more powerful concept. Searching by language is simple, but usually less helpful than searching a regional search engine. Other fields may be absolutely critical to accomplish some unique and rare task, but we will not need them often. 
The real complexity comes when we step beyond our favorite global search engine and closely follow the more subtle movements of each global search engine. There is a lot of movement. Words typed twice in a search query mean something to Google. Microsoft Live Search seems to have difficulties with the URL field search. In July 2006, Google suddenly lost the ability to combine a word and a URL field search in a single search. A search like Jupyter in URL colon Wikipedia gave a false answer. A week later, it's working again. So arises a complicated chore of teasing out the many distinct differences between search engines, watching as these differences change. We can deal with this complexity in two ways. Firstly, strive to understand these subtle changes in depth. Research Buzz, a weekly newsletter by internet research expert Tara Kalashane, addresses this kind of search engine minutiae well. Her newsletter covers such topics as Google's strange date of indexing field, based on the Julian calendar. You and I use the Gregorian calendar. Consider also watching the print publications online and searcher by information today, as well as online currents here in Australia. We can scan searchenginewatch.com for this sort of information too. Alternatively, curtail our avid enthusiasm for all things searchable and reach just for the established search techniques and tactics. If we need something special, only then learn how a particular search tactic works on our favorite search engine. I doubt many of us need to know more about search engines than what I have just shared with you. They promise to grow more complex with time. Stepping away from some of the complexity makes good sense. I recommend you retreat to the established search tactics of quotes, minus, or, as well as title, URL, and link field searching. Recognize there are further fields and specific idiosyncrasies to many search engines. Now get to practice. On to practice in precision. Enclose concepts in quotes. Subtract information foreign to our search. Use field searches to specify information qualities. These are all opportunities for precision. Here are a few examples set in the standard search engine punctuation used by Google and Yahoo. Quote, deep tissue, close quote, massage. Shows us web pages with the phrase deep tissue and the word massage somewhere in the web page. Deep tissue is a concept, a certain style of massage, so we have good reason to use quotes. Diabetes minus, quote, childhood diabetes, close quote. Show us pages with the word diabetes, but not the phrase childhood diabetes, which I understand has a different cause. In title colon Cadbury shows us web pages with Cadbury in the title. We can expect this to include the corporate website of the makers of Cadbury chocolates. Greenpeace in URL colon dot AU shows us web pages with the word Greenpeace, but only those found on web pages with dot AU in the web address. Thus, show us Australian web pages mentioning Greenpeace. As expected, Greenpeace's Australian website leads the list. University, Sydney, in URL, colon, dot edu. List web pages including the words University and Sydney with edu in the web address. This list starts with links to several universities in Sydney. In URL, colon, www.ccm.net, slash, tilde, jr, smith, slash. Reveal all the web pages that search engines have found in this directory. Link colon stamps.com. List and reveal the number of web pages linking to stamps.com. Link colon patents.uspto.gov. Link colon patents.gov.uk. List web pages that link to both the U.S. and U.K. patent databases. We will have many more examples as we read further. Just remember, search engine punctuation allows us to ask specific questions. Search engines respond with far more focus. Precision is the second method of finding information with a global search engine. The first, of course, involves throwing a few words at a global search engine, then browsing the first few leads returned, a process commonly known as surfing. Surfing is not enough. The Internet is like a 17th century Dutch painting. A small bitten apple in the corner of a picture, upon reflection, suggests the biblical story of Adam and Eve, the idea of sin. A dented pot suggests carelessness. A half-eaten fig, sensuality. The more we look, the more we reveal, the more we understand. Internet searching initially appears as a simple topic dominated by the simplest of questions. What words shall I throw at a search engine today? Now that we have sketched out a way to be precise with what we ask a search engine, thanks to quotes, minus, or, as well as title, URL, and link, we can again confront the simplest of questions. What words and punctuation shall we throw at a search engine today? Sadly, in so summarizing Internet searching, we have lost almost everything that is wonderful and beautiful, delicious about the Internet. 
like a talented chef introducing a novice to their spice shelf. Think of the disappointment. By all means, cook with pepper. Cook with chili, too. We will certainly find pepper and chili in some of the finest dishes. However, please recognize that more than spice is needed to turn an egg into a souffle. Spice is just one element of a grand feast. Many a search question can be answered without skill, thanks to the Internet. Many more can be answered with search engine punctuation. We can get some kind of answer to most questions. Should it take a little longer? Who cares? Should we get a mediocre answer, an untrustworthy answer? Hey, it's the Internet. We should expect this. Stop. Such an attitude is the complete opposite to that of a talented Internet searcher. We are trying to accomplish something grand. A talented searcher draws far more complete answers, far higher quality answers, and answers to far more challenging questions in far less time. And we should expect this of a skill like Internet searching. Would a novice naturally make the right choices without experience? Has the Internet somehow changed the value of experience? Can answers really be found by just whispering a few words to a plastic box? Only if an exquisite meal is a matter of sprinkling a little spice. There is something deceptively simple in the image of the Internet as a realm. We either search like an old database or browse like the shelves of a library. The unspoken image for such an Internet is a mass of web pages dumped in a pile yet searchable all the same. Perhaps the Internet is so vast, all we can do is search. We search with luck and time, but not skill. That Internet is a mirage, a horrible distortion of the truth. Internet searching is indeed a skill. In addition to search engine punctuation, this skill includes the great deal of library science that at first seems either self-evident or completely off-topic. Later, we will start anticipating information, incorporating even more library science as well as sociology. Furthermore, the field of Internet searching continues to develop. New techniques and concepts continue to emerge. Our tools develop, too. If we look at this historically, we have been rushing at a maddening pace through so many approaches to find information. With this in mind, let us revisit the word surfing, that familiar sensation of moving from one website to another, hunting for something that interests us. It is a close cousin to reading the newspaper and browsing the library bookshelf. In essence, we seek something of interest without a clear idea of what we seek and where we think we will find it. We search blind. It is one of life's most rewarding experiences, this grazing on interesting information. Serendipity leads us to many beautiful gemstones. My personal love includes grazing on historical maps and Hubble photographs. Unfortunately, such grazing is not a good way to answer questions. When we have a particular question in mind, surfing wastes time, surfing never tells us when to stop, and surfing rarely leads us to the best information. This is not to say that the key to searching is to know and accurately describe what we seek in advance. Sometimes such an approach works, Sometimes such an approach is maddeningly frustrating. Let us just recognize that surfing is not the solution. Allow me to explain. Country profiles. Suppose we are interested in Afghanistan. We type Afghanistan into our favorite search engine. If we favor Google, we receive a list of 172 million matches, with the top 20 listed for us to browse. Our search engine thoughtfully generates what it calculates as a helpful list, but with just our interest in Afghanistan to go on, the search engine must make some very unfortunate assumptions. For example, the search engine must assume we know little about Afghanistan, so it generates a list of several general and popular websites. In another setting, in another time, we would reach for a large encyclopedia. Perhaps we are interested in something specific about Afghanistan. Say we want Afghanistan's vital statistics, so to speak, its birth and death rate, its gross national product, and ethnic mix. We are looking for something called a country profile a kind of standard document that describes a country briefly with statistics and precise description. Country profiles may be familiar to you as books like the World Yearbook. They read like the country descriptions found in encyclopedias. Perhaps you may have seen an economic synopsis of a country published in The Economist magazine. It turns out country profiles are far more numerous than we probably expect. Many of the largest, most highly respected international organizations constantly update their country profiles and make them publicly available through the Internet. A search of Google for, quote, country profiles, close quote, Afghanistan, lists some of the most popular of these. Their list includes such standards as the country profiles by the Library of Congress and the U.S. Department of State, as well as an extensive list of dot-com sites publishing something of news or the economy. The list also includes websites that link to country profiles, like corporate-information.com. If we search a different global search engine, we get a slightly different list, though the very popular CIA World Factbook usually appears near the top of any list. 
A directory like the Yahoo directory could also be a fine place to hunt. Directories are still very useful and respectable search tools. The Yahoo directory lists some country profiles, though the list is fairly bare. It includes the CIA World Factbook, and the country profiles by the Library of Congress, the U.S. Department of State, and several dot-com sites. Select any basic search tool and receive a similar list of resources that summarize Afghanistan. In this way, we can easily answer a question that could be answered by a world yearbook or a large encyclopedia. What if we have a more challenging question, or a question that demands greater depth? About six years ago, I researched country profiles in detail. I sought all the country profiles that existed at the time, listed them, compared them, tossed out the poor ones, and crafted the result as an article. I included internet library and commercial resources, as well as other avenues to explore. This article sits at spireproject.com slash country.htm. This article vividly illuminates the perils of searching. At the time I wrote the article, I found free country profiles from more than 40 of the most highly respected organizations in the world, including general country profiles from CIA World Factbook, Country Indicators of Foreign Policy, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, the UN Infonation, UN Statistical Division, UNICEF, U.S. Census Department, U.S. Department of State, U.S. Library of Congress, World Bank, travel advisories from the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, UK Foreign Consular Office, U.S. Department of State. Country health reports from Health Canada, Pan American Health Organization, the U.S. Center for Disease Control, the CDC, and the World Health Organization, WHO. Country reports on war and justice from Amnesty International, the Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, the Canadian Forces College, CARE Country Profiles, ELDIS, Gateway of Development Studies, Human Rights Watch, International Committee of Red Cross, Initiative for Conflict Resolution and Ethnicity, INCOR, the UN De Development Program, UNDP, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, the US Committee for Refugees, the US Department of State. Economic country profiles from the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Commission of the European Union, Food and Agricultural Organization, International Monetary Fund, IMF, the New Zealand Trade Development Board, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, the UN International Development Organization, UNIDO, the U.S. Department of State, the U.S. Embassies, the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the U.S. Trade Representatives, World Bank, World Trade Organization. Let your eyes skim over this list. Consider it. This is truly an impressive list. Many of the most significant organizations in our world are included. Where does surfing lie in this picture? Throw the word country profile at a search engine, and we retrieve a list that includes maybe six or more of the famous country profiles listed above. The others are buried too deeply in the Internet to surf too easily. Many country profiles are not popular, promoted, or otherwise likely to rise to the top of a search engine's results page. Instead, surfing excavates a great many resources that serve as proxies for a good encyclopedia. Many will be dot-com sites lacking both the depth and authority that all great information possesses. Surfing would surely miss the huge published tomes of the OECD, each running to over 80 pages of quality economic forecasting. Instead, we reach out to a summary by a news organization that appears to miss economic commentary entirely. Oh, the specific documents we miss may change, but the facts we miss them remain. Great resources fill the Internet. Surfing leads us to just a few. Let us leave Afghanistan for a moment and think of something very specific. Sometimes information is invisible to all but a couple of search tools. Sometimes information is simply not online. Say we seek the corporate website to a company registered in the United Kingdom. Surfing would suggest we have merely to keep looking and we will find their website. If not this results page, then the next. If not this search engine, then the next. If this website does not answer our question, try another. No step says stop, give up, it's time to leave. Surfing, unlike searching, does not address this possibility. We quit when we get bored or frustrated. When searching well, we build a different relationship with information. Rather than browse what is offered, we also work with notions of what else is out there. We anticipate our destination. If we have little chance of finding answers, abundant clues will tell us so. While surfing, we do not notice these clues. Back to Afghanistan. Suppose we now have a specific question in mind. We are writing an essay on the evils of the Taliban, and we are concerned that so much of our experience comes by way of the U.S. news media. To correct any potential bias, we need some additional proof that the Taliban really were bad people. We want convincing proof, hopefully from a non-news media source. It seems a simple enough task until we get into it. 
If we roam the Internet moving from one page to another, hunting for something that sounds reliable and trustworthy, we will probably find it. We will stumble upon something we can build a case for being unbiased and supportive of our conclusions. Uh, this is not proof. We find proof in a page published by the Human Rights Watch that documents a civilian massacre perpetrated by Taliban forces. The publisher of this document, Human Rights Watch, is widely respected and experienced in documenting human rights violations. This document arises from first-hand interviews with those affected. A witness list is attached. It is perhaps the highest quality information of this kind, short of being there when the bullets fly. And it is completely separate from the U.S. news media, the potential bias we wish to counter. Unfortunately, when I first looked, this particular Human Rights Watch report was not indexed by all the web, nor by Alta Vista. Google did index the page, but we would never find it on Google unless we searched for the word Yakolang, the site of the massacre. And why would we search for Yakolang? Must we already know a document exists to find it? Records of the Yakolang massacre have grown more prominent with time. It is easier to find today, years after the event, though not because indexes have grown more comprehensive. Though substantially larger, search engine indexes have probably grown less comprehensive. We may need to expect that information not yet prominent will simply not be indexed until later. Surfing has a stumble upon this page using search tools that initially ignore it. If they do not ignore it, they at least do not recognize its importance. In the example of country profiles, we search through a list of prominent websites looking for sites without prominence. A rather stupid endeavor if we think about it. Surfing tells us we will find our proof, our not yet widely respected or recognized proof, thanks to providence, serendipity, and accident. Three techniques we simply cannot trust to deliver quality answers. This is why surfing rarely leads us to the best information. We know this. Anyone wandering the Internet knows something is amiss. We know because we feel frustration when we search. We waste time. We do not know when to stop. We only occasionally get the best information. Of course we're frustrated. Let this frustration drive us to move beyond surfing. As soon as we feel frustrated, as soon as we ask complicated and challenging questions, we should reach for a different arsenal. We should search in a different manner. Frustration is, in fact, one of the clues we listen for. It is our friend. When we feel frustrated, stop and search another way. A diversion. The mid-morning mist still held its grip on the valley below. The cold stones had not yet lost their moisture. A small boy of twelve sat quietly in the window alcove on the second floor of the castle tower as he looked south to the hills speckled with gray-white sheep. As the morning chill tried gently to crawl into the blanket wrapped tightly around him, the cold stones he sat upon chilled him with more brutal directness. With a long shiver and a sigh, Albert stood and moved back from the cold world beyond the window. He quietly retreated to the adjoining room, warmed with the help of aging tapestries and a fire just of embers from the night before. On a cold January morn in the year 1195, a young French boy named Albert, second son to the regional magistrate for Toulouse, quietly decided his life's work would be as a knight. Knighting as a career path was well regarded in the Moyanage, the Middle Ages. His soft downy hair and small hands and skinny frame betrayed his youth, but he had connections and the support of a father keen to promote justice in the realm. It was a fine arrangement. Albert would settle into the task of learning to be a knight. He had surprisingly much to learn, too. Certainly Albert needed a great deal of technical skill in the use of weapons, but the city of Toulouse also expected its knights to be religiously pure and relatively educated in the fields of the day. A knight was not only expected to stand for justice and equality, he was expected to recognize the just and righteous path. Albert had a great deal to learn. We, too, have a journey ahead of us, a journey filled with complexity and confusion. To ease this journey, we shall follow this fictional Albert through a time in the Middle Ages when his own humble and simple journey became as complex and confusing as our own. Perhaps Albert's story will help us periodically lift our attention to the grander picture, to the art and insight that infuses the best of search. Internet searching is not so very difficult. Most likely, you can already find non-Internet information easily enough. You can find a book in a library and ask directions from a stranger. We just need to extend these skills to cover Internet information as well. The struggle ahead is not to grasp a vast and unfamiliar field of expertise. We struggle instead to understand how skills and techniques we already know and use elsewhere apply on the Internet as well. We need only clarity. What should become apparent quickly in this quest, so I will alert you now, is that searching the web is about being aware of many aspects of information we frequently overlook. 
For example, say we ask a passerby for directions. Did he fling his hand in a seemingly random direction? Did he look confused and lost himself? Was that a bottle of cheap wine in his left hand? We look for such clues. Such clues have a bearing on the value of the advice. With talented internet searching, we use the same tools and ask similar questions as less experienced searchers, but we ask in a way that reveals more about the information involved. Every aspect of the information, the web address, publisher, author, context, format, pages that link to the information, the intended purpose of the information, how the publisher justifies their effort, everything comes to have much more meaning than we usually attribute. We are helped in this journey by the insights of no less than three disciplines, computer science, library science, and sociology. We can explore explanations and move freely among all three. Thus, we will craft historical explanations. We will explore the inner workings of patents, newspapers, and books. We will delve into how global search engines rank their results. We will explore a variety of publishing models and consider the future of the Internet in view of the tension between capitalism and utopianism. In short, we will wander all over the place as we aim for effective use of Internet information. A young French boy, Albert, was a simple soul. In an era bleak by today's measure, he chose to be a knight, a noble profession with generous opportunity to do good in a world with much hostility and fear. Searching is not a profession. These days, searching is an element of so many professions. However, librarians have perhaps the closest ties to searching. Certainly librarians consider the social importance of their work, worry about issues of access, and are employed to help patrons find their way through the often confusing and unfamiliar world of information. This always sounded noble to me. For several years, the librarian profession drifted, uncertain in its role in the Internet-powered society. It seemed to some that libraries and library science had become passé. Perhaps we do not need libraries and librarians as much as before the Internet arrived. I will take this opportunity to dispel more of this uncertainty. Library buildings stocked with aging books may lose some of their luster, but one of the pillars of this book is that library science is vital to the effective use of the Internet. Many existing advances first emerged in libraries decades ago. Many future advances born in library sciences are already in the pipeline. Library science is not the whole picture, though. We must also learn some fairly arcane computer technology. Learn about the bookmarklet and the domain name. Juggle windows. Use shortcut keys to speed us on our way. Our quest for pattern and structure also takes us to investigate capitalism and academic recognition we will reveal a more holistic picture of the Internet's role in the flow of information. Why do people publish? Where would certain kinds of information be published? Who publishes that kind of information most successfully? If the Internet is a galaxy, this galaxy of ours has a history and a future evolving from this history. How the Internet has evolved fascinates me. It is surprisingly understandable, too. Library science, computer science, and sociology, so much ground lies before us, so much insight to consider so much to help us make better use of Internet information. Before we wander too far, however, I wish to introduce a searcher's most trusted ally. We will get to know her much more intimately. She is the Elevated Vista. Engaging the world of information. Anyone can hold a sword. Anyone can stride into battle with a weapon in hand and try to strike the enemy. Connecting is entirely a different matter. Albert started his lessons not with the sword, but with the pike, a long, solid stick with a sharp blade at one end. Albert was to hold the pike firmly in his hands, stand in a formation with 15 other soldiers, four to a line, four deep, then run at the enemy. If the pikemen worked effectively as a team, the enemy soldiers would meet four sets of sharp blades before they could begin to slash at the first pikeman. Of course, the best defense against pikemen is more pikemen, with longer pikes. The ancient Greeks, under Alexander the Great, used pikes as long as 20 feet. They decimated the troops of the great Persian king Darius in this way, literally running through the enemy lines. There are different pikes, too. Some have sharp hooks on the end for unseating a knight from a horse. Some have blades for slicing. The pikes Albert worked with were heavy, laborious weapons, but they could be very murderous. Albert studied hard. War is a little more complicated than grabbing a pike and racing at an enemy. A search is, too. Grabbing the first available weapon, a global search engine, then thrusting words at it is just one of many approaches to searching the Internet. If we did little else, we would often feel frustrated. Let us extend our reach. Let us look beyond the recommendations our chosen search engine offers us and consider the view. Let us interact with the world of information. Whenever we do a search from now on, the first item I want you to notice is the number of matches or hits reported by the search engine. 
Whether this number is 5 or 5 million, this number answers several important questions. 1. Did we do something wrong? A very small or large number indicates a spelling mistake or a problem with how we punctuated our search. 2. Can we refine our search further? A large number of matches invites us to ask a more specific question. 3. How much information is there on this topic? The number of matches indicates the size of the reservoir of information we have to draw from. Lift our view to the horizon. Look at one page of results and see the world of information. Suppose we work for a government agency looking after the interests of seniors. Our task today, uncover the issues involved in seniors using the Internet. We decide our keyword is aging, A-G-I-N-G, and our simple Internet search for aging returns a large number of matches, 212 million matches as of mid-2006 on Google. However, as we restrict our interests just to Australia by typing aging, A-G-I-N-G, in URL colon dot A-U, the number drops to 804,000. From over 200 million to less than a million. Seems strange? Australia generally accounts for around 4% of all Internet content, not half a percent as suggested here. This may be our only hint that in Australia the word aging is spelled A-G-E-I-N-G. A search for aging or aging in URL colon dot AU returns 4.5 million matches, adding 3.7 million matches to our list. Let us try again. Say we wonder if it's possible to search the Internet as a career, perhaps as a commercial researcher. We search Google for commercial database or commercial research and receive 216 million matches. Far too many, I should think. Is something perhaps wrong with our search query? Do you see it? We have used or incorrectly. We have asked for the word commercial, then the word database or commercial, and then the word research. That is not a specific search at all. I think we meant to type, quote, commercial database, close quote, or, quote, commercial research, close quote, remembering to add the quotes. Look at the horizon. Notice it's not where it should be. Say we visit the website of our state library and we hunt for a book on research techniques. A title search for research returns a list of over 4,000 books. Shall we craft a more specific request? We could add more words or specify a particular subject we are interested in. For instance, market research does not interest us today, so perhaps we can search in a way that reflects this. The number of books on research tells us we can refine our search further. It works in much the same way on the Internet. This reminds me of a fine technique used in commercial article searches. When searching a commercial quality database, keep limiting a search until we build a list that returns only as many records as we are willing to consider, usually about 50. Now browse this list. Read from the titles. Notice the publications. Consider the length of each article. From this list of 50, select 3 to 5 articles to read, or 5 to 10 articles if we must find them in a nearby library, since some will be unavailable. This tactic works exceptionally well with commercial quality article databases, like those of the university libraries and those available through database retailers like LexisNexis and Dialog. Let us now apply this approach on the Internet. Craft a specific search. Refine the search so it generates perhaps 50 matches. Now browse this list. Select several likely candidates worth perusing. The criteria we use to select peruseworthy information will be discussed later in this book, but briefly it involves matching clues from the web address with where we anticipate our answers will reside. Approaching the Internet in this way is the perfect foil to search engines that offer answers that seem far too general and prominent. When we want a specific search, we focus. At first glance, this can mean we add more words to our search query until we have something very specific. Better to add punctuation. Ask that words appear together as a specific concept. Change artificial intelligence to, quote, artificial intelligence, close quote. Should a word be in the title? Can we discard information on market research? Can we limit our search to a particular type of research, perhaps a certain country? This kind of thinking leads to a much more rewarding search than just adding more words. We also build a specific search as a process. As we build, we watch the number of matches. It tells us how much further we can refine our search. I usually search several times before I stop and read a list of results. A good search gradually takes shape. We type Shakespeare, then Shakespeare Unconditional Love, then Shakespeare Unconditional Love Romeo, then Shakespeare quote Unconditional Love close quote Romeo. Remember, the number of matches tells us something of the quantity of Internet information available to us. 
Suppose our special friend is coming to dinner next week, and we want to cook a favorite childhood recipe. We search for Brazil nut cake, her favorite, and find over 100 recipes indexed by Google. Just five of these recipes do not include the ingredient flour to which our friend is allergic. These numbers have meaning. These numbers suggest our search is a challenging search, a search that ranking technologies cannot assist. The request we seek may not be published in an easy-to-reach location. We may need to move beyond the global search engines. My thoughts turn to various recipe databases and cooking discussion group archives. My thoughts turn to other places where recipes pool. Say our hacker friend talks of smurfing, a denial-of-service attack that can take down a website and land us behind bars. Shall we find the software that does this? A search for smurfing software returns just 47 matches, many of them glossaries. Once again, these numbers have meaning. This will be a challenging search. Ranking technologies will not help us. We may need to look elsewhere in more private locations. Match numbers also tell us something of the awareness of information on a topic. Sometimes this alone is important. In a search for, quote, David Novak, close quote, quote, Spire Project, close quote, we are given a number of matches that directly reflects the public awareness of my work on the Internet. A similar popularity number emerges from a link search, as in link, colon, spireproject.com. Websites with more links have been promoted more effectively, have been on the Internet longer, and have demonstrated an ability to attract interest. Such sites often have better information, an assumption we will explore further in Chapter 2. When we ask a specific question, the number of matches we encounter tells us something. It tells us if we are on the right track. It tells us if we made a mistake. It tells us if we found the right words, words that someone in the industry would use. A search for staff loyalty, for example, leads to many resources in business, but very few in nursing. Why? Because nursing literature uses a different term. The literature does not describe it as staff loyalty. I think to look more closely only because we found so few matches. When we discuss feedback research later in the book, this elevated vista tells us even more. But we will never hear what is being said if we don't listen. Glimpse the elevated vista in the number of matches returned. Savor this momentary view. My choice of search engine. Slice, parry, thrust, lunge. While the pike relies on strength, a sword depends on skill. At his father's insistence, a tutor started to teach Albert footwork. Swordplay is a dance, forward, back, side to side. We constantly vary our momentum and balance. Albert thought he understood footwork. He strived to move more quickly to improve his balance. It was frustrating, though. For try as he would, his skill with a sword scarcely improved. Albert had missed something. More than keeping his own balance, Albert had to judge the footwork of his opponent, too. Attack when the opponent has least control over their movements. Lunge when the opponent steps forward. Step to the side as the opponent thrusts. Slice as their side becomes vulnerable. In this way, swordplay is a deadly dance for two. Footwork establishes balance. Footwork creates opportunities to attack. The global search engines I use are Google and Yahoo's All the Web, though I may shortly change to Google and Yahoo. My choice rests on what I need to build a fine and specific search, good field searching and database size. I declare my preferences not to suggest others are not important or to ask you to change your preference. I wish only to explain why I use these search engines and not others. Perhaps this will help you choose what is right for you. I cannot advise you further because specifics change too quickly for a book to address, and comparing search engines never fully captured my interest. Google originally attained fame for introducing a ranking technology built on link behavior. This approach to ranking has since been enhanced and implemented in all global search engines. Google now deserves our attention and praise because of its size and the flexibility of its field searches. Size is a fuzzy issue here. Up from 8 billion records in 2005, Google is now much larger, but of an undisclosed size. A similar story covers the other search engines. I find the views of Danny Sullivan of Search Engine Watch persuasive when he describes how we cannot easily compare size across search engines anymore and how counts do not measure comprehensiveness. However, relative size remains a reason why I look to Google. When we search in a specific manner, size matters, at least in theory. We want to reach for the largest search engine near at hand. Unfortunately, it can be hard to decide which is the largest. Here is a simple demonstration based on typing Spire Project Search on April 4, 2006. Google, 18,800 records mentioned, 742 displayed. All the web, 4,710 records mentioned, 1,100 displayed. MSN Search, 2,900 records mentioned, 
450 displayed. Yahoo, 5,620 links recorded, 1,000 displayed. Repeating this search on July 5, 2007, sees these numbers fall some, but still shows a similar gap between mentioned links and those available for display. Google, 12,700 records mentioned, 1,000 displayed. Yahoo, 3,470 records mentioned, 1,000 displayed. Live search, 2,717 records mentioned, 1,000 displayed. Size accounts for only half my reasoning. How flexible is the search technology? Unfortunately, Google is clumsy with some of its search techniques. All three top global search engines are clumsy with plurals, but by using OR, we can get around that. Google also does not display many results in a linked search, so I use an alternative, my old favorite, all the web. A linked search for spireproject.com on January 15, 2007 retrieves Google, 64 links recorded, 76 displayed. All the web, 655 and 180 recorded, 304 displayed. Live search, 1,030 links recorded, 450 displayed. Yahoo, 474 and 263 links recorded, 440 displayed. The second numbers emerge when we include www.spireproject.com in our search. To complicate matters further, Yahoo has link domain colon, a specialty link field search, and numbers like those just listed change quickly over time. It is enough to drive one crazy. Once we get our minds around the fact that match numbers are estimates that can change mid-search, that a few hundred more matches can be found in a pinch, and that some recorded links can never be seen while other links were never visited when indexed, we get a taste of the wonderful clarity enjoyed by global search engine observers. With sanity, we can say Google is not strong in providing links at this moment, so I use another search engine for that purpose. Google has other weaknesses, too. At this time, we cannot use the link field search to triangulate related information. Google has a field for date of indexing, but it's based on the number of days since noon, January 1st, 4,713 B.C. Don't ask. Don't even think to ask. A rough index date search appears on Google's advanced search page, and Tara Kalashane and Rail Dornfest describe several script-based solutions in their book, Google Hacks. Google is responsible for maintaining a lovely database of newsgroup discussion, now called Google Groups. Google's image search is very large. Google's new search is promising, too. I love their support for significant Internet resources, but I consider these side databases as completely different and distinct from the Google search engine. I do not let such side databases influence my choice of search engine for reasons that will become evident in Chapter 5. In summary, I start with Google unless I have reasons to start elsewhere. I start with Google because I am familiar and satisfied with their search engine punctuation. I occasionally wonder if it is time to change, if it is a time to favor another search engine. Whether Google deserves your attention or not, do take the pressure off the constant quest to compare search engines. One, we need a large search engine. Two, we need a decent URL field search. Three, and we need to move freely from our search engine to other search tools for tasks they do better. Make sure we have the required tools nearby. Get familiar with them. Then get on with learning how to make search engines more revealing and rewarding. Frankly, we do not need that many global search engines anyway. If you love another, fine, as long as it has a good field search and is big. In terms of the all-important rivalry between global search engines, I'm particularly mindful of Yahoo's experience and Microsoft's efforts. I see no reason to believe either firm cannot produce a superior search engine. I see many reasons why we would not realize they had developed a better search engine already. In purchasing AltaVista and all the web, Yahoo acquired most of the Internet's best search interfaces. AltaVista allows for near and was the first big search engine to offer brackets and true truncation. However, I suspect search engine interfaces are not so significant an obstacle in making a great search engine. Remember, much of this technology was worked out in the commercial information world and implemented in commercial databases decades ago. The future rivalry between leading global search engines will be monumentally important to them, I am sure. I think it will be less significant to us. Before we proceed, let me confess one point of far more significance, the popular misconception that search engines index everything on the Internet. This is misleading and very wrong. Throughout Internet history, all the leading search tools have made similar claims. Now that we no longer have even rough estimates of the size of our search engines, we will surely fall into this trap again. How much of the Internet is indexed by our favorite search engine? It is truly very hard to say. Perhaps 10%, perhaps 20 certainly not 50% or 80 just how much is missing largely depends on what we mean by being on the Internet. 
older estimates of the Internet size range from 10 billion to 300 billion records, growing at who knows what rate. Google has grown from a claimed 2 billion records in June 2002 to 8 billion records in November 2004, to a suggested 20 billion in September 2005. Given the sheer size of the Internet, its rate of growth is probably slowing, growing but doubling less quickly. Given that the latest round of search engine size wars have an index is growing faster than before, perhaps we're closing the gap. Perhaps. Against this conclusion, we must weigh several discordant notes. Several studies call into question the claimed size of these databases. Database numbers have in the past included unvisited, merely referenced material. While claims like Google's statement in November 2005 stating it was three times the size of any competitor seems implausible. Quoted index sizes are not what I would consider good information. Regrettably, we have equally poor information on the size of the Internet. One approach to this confusion is to focus on the information world from which Internet information is drawn. Do not underestimate the size of the world of information that surrounds us. It is vastly larger than the Internet, and if the Internet is not far beyond 100 billion records by now, this is only because information publishers have not found a way to justify publishing more, more swiftly. We will discuss this further in Chapter 9. This means that even if search engine databases could incorporate much of the Internet, and they do not, they cover little of the information world around us. Our question of coverage remains unanswered, an unhelpful conclusion to be sure, but one I cannot avoid. Will search engines continue to grow more swiftly than the Internet? The cost of computer memory and computing power is falling, and publishing rewards are falling as well. We can hope. However, if I am right and coverage hangs around 10 to 20 percent for the next five years, then do ask yourself, how could I possibly find information not indexed by a global search engine? We have problems enough making the search engines cough up the information they do contain. How can we reach beyond them? Until we can answer this question, we have not truly touched the heart of Internet searching. We are bound to our search engines, encumbered by every bias they display. Eventually, we will reach beyond them, and in this process achieve a far more realistic and rewarding relationship with search engines and our world of information. Let us first just recognize that we can be very specific with global search engines. Punctuation is the key. This is the first step to a better search. The next step, prominence.